And then one day he said to me, you know, why don't you get, you know, more involved? And I wasn't really thinking that I would get more involved, but I kind of, then he just said, well, I've just been traveling and I've been doing this and that. He used to put on uh, spiritual festivals all over the country. And he said, you know, oh, you could have come with me if I'd known. And a little light bulb went on in my head and I thought, well, I don't really want to join the temple, but I, if I could just travel around with you, that would be really cool. And so that was kind of it. I became his right hand man for about seven years. And I, we went to Africa, to India. We put festivals on all over the UK and Ireland for the public to come along um, for free. So we would be doing fundraising. I'm essentially I became a fundraiser and a project manager, really. But I, I didn't think of it like that's in the language of employment, if you like. Um, but but I was yeah, I was I was a monk. My interview with Ravenel was just so interesting to hear him go from monk to filmmaker. You, you've just got to listen to the journey and the magical interactions he's had with people, with friends that he fell out with, and even asking, you know, meaningful life questions at the age of eight. Um, really, really fascinating. And I know you will enjoy it. And um, and do listen all the way through because he has some excellent advice for any aspiring business owners, but also us business owners that are running businesses right now. So enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Ravenel. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. Pleased to be here. Really great to have you come on the podcast. And we met a couple of months ago and we talked about lots of things to do with the film industry and animation and everything. And it is, I'm, I'm so delighted to have you here because I know you're a fellow storyteller and you do really great, inspiring films as well. Um, and we'll get on to that towards the end. But the first question I ask all my guests right at the beginning, and that is, please, can you share with the listeners a little bit about your personal life? So where were you born? A bit about your education. Have you moved? Where do you now live? Maybe yeah, a bit definitely. about your family if you wish to, but you don't have to. Um, yeah. Just so people get a sense of where well, Ravenol has come from. Yes, definitely. Well, I'll just get it out of the way straight away because people usually ask me about the name. So um, I grew up in Dublin in Ireland, but my dad uh, had seen a movie called Showboat. It's an old musical film. And there was a character in that film called Ravenel, oh. uh, the Mississippi gambler. So he, he just decided if I ever have a son, I'm going to give him that name. So I got oh, the name. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit, uh, bit unusual, but I've um, And were I've you pleased? Were you yeah, I mean, well, uh, when I was, uh, I, I grew, in, I grew into it. Yeah, I, I've, I've never um, felt like, oh, I, w I wish I hadn't had it. So I've, I've always been happy to have it. Yeah, I've definitely. never met a Ravenel before, and it's really unusual. So it stands out. So well done, Dad. <laughs> Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Dublin and Ireland. Um, I wanted to be a stockbroker as a teenager. I was a very money minded, uh, business minded kind of uh, teenager, but quickly took a, a sort of a different turn in life and, and sort of felt like I wanted to do something that maybe had a bit more uh, benefit to other people. Um, first of all, did a degree in psychology um, and enjoyed that, but felt it let me down a bit because I wanted to study happiness. And at that time, they were desperate to have psychology uh, accepted as a hard science. So they said, well, you can't study that because we can't measure it. And I was like, oh, that's, a bit that's a bit dumb. <laughs> so I was a bit upset about that. Um, but then um, it's from a very young age, it always had a deep yearning to understand I guess the questions behind the everyday, just sort of like, what what are we doing here? Where are we? And, and what's it all about kind of thing. So at 20, 2021, I, I actually became a full-time Hare Krishna monk and spent seven years doing that, which which um, whenever I tell people that, they're like, wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and really enjoyed that and learned a huge amount about that. I'm sure we can talk a bit about it later. But, yeah, um, I'd love to. I uh, then found myself at about 29, um, you know, having, you know, well, learned a wealth of knowledge from that and took a great deal of value from it. But thinking, well, you know, I'd like to have a family and I don't think I can maintain that that lifestyle of a monk at that level, but I want to take it out into the world. Mm. Um, and but I also had no money at that time because obviously it was a different type of lifestyle I was living. So sure. I kind of swung back over to the 
to the business side, got a bit into property a bit. My dad had been in and made some money and, and bought some properties um, and then sort of yo-yoed back and forwards between uh, making some money and that type, more business side of life and then back towards the more uh, creating an impact side. So I went back and worked um, as a project manager for education business partnerships, right. creating um, positive role models for young children who are kind of at the edges of education and possibly getting kicked out of education. Um, and then went back to university and did an MBA and did my research on a thing called venture philanthropy, which for me was a real breath of fresh air because as you can sort of tell so far from my story it was always a story of two halves yes i was kind of interested in business and money and then i was interested in making a difference but these two didn't come together no so th this brought them together um and uh it's like where business people are thinking how can i bring my networks how can i bring my intelligence my thinking my what i what i know works in business and try to uh, help people have a bigger impact in a social community environmental sense um and I, I finished that and I was kind of a bit unsure what to do. And I remembered back when I lived in Africa as a monk, for, I lived in East Africa for two years, I'd made a film. Um, and it was to show people what we were doing. We were running some uh, orphanages for street children. And I thought if people could see this, maybe they would help us. Uh, and they did. Uh, and then again, I made another film in 2003 uh, when I was doing the work with young people in education. And again, it helped us to get uh, more funding and support. So I thought, wow, this is really um, something, you know, it's a powerful medium. And I started my company, Be Inspired Films, which is all about using film to try and help uh, make a bigger impact. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, in a nutshell, my story. Wow. But I, I, that, that seemed to happen quite quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I did. I did try and condense it there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's wind back a little bit then, and yes. let's let's deep dive into a few things that came up in my head as you were talking, and that is mm -hmm. when you when you said you wanted to study happiness, happiness. Yeah. And you were interested in that. Where did that come from? I mean, how did yeah. you decide that you were interested? In it? Was it family? Was it? Did somebody inspire it, you? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, because we're obviously influenced by things around us and people around us all the time. But I, I feel like it was um, a deep driving yearning to understand it myself. Because I think most people can, uh, I, I believe, relate to the, well, we're all conscious, aren't we? We're all having the human experience, if you like. Yes. Um, and we all most of the time would, you know, would like to be happy. And so I just felt it was such a core um, question or a core aspect to the human condition. And I just felt, therefore, it was something I wanted to understand more. Mm. Um, and I remember as well being about eight years old and standing um, next to my mom. Um, we, we had a sort of a laundry area in our house where I don't know what they like an airing cupboard or a hot press. We used to call it like where she'd put the clothes mm. in to kind of air and dry. Um, and I was asking her, it was this a question was going round and round in my head. Wh what what does it mean? Like, so I'm, I'm experiencing this whole world and this whole thing because I'm conscious and I'm, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. Um, and what if, what if I wasn't experiencing it, would it still be here? So it was the it was this kind of a, the, the, the question around is everything just a relative subjective experience or is there some kind of bigger reality than that? That and was so, at eight years old. Yeah, that was at eight years old. <laughs> yeah. Holy mackerel. I mean, I didn't start asking those questions until 2004. When I was like in my forties, <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose it's a question. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? Though, at some point or another, um, whether it's you know when we look out into the nighttime sky or whatever, or we're in the middle of the night, we wake up and we're we're sort of we're we're slightly in, thinking in a different headspace, or something happens to us. You know, I think at some point everybody must have that question whenever it happens to them. And I just sort of, I guess, had it early and. Um, so hence, you know, throughout my teens, I was studying different ancient books of wisdom and traditions and stuff. And I was really trying to get a handle on on kind of, yeah, what was the, the purpose or the meaning behind this experience we're having? And, and so I guess then obviously that led on to my time as a monk and stuff. And and even now, I, it's 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 a sort of a, a bit of a big mystery, but it's a it's a kind of a wonderful one, mm -hmm. I think. And. And so what did your parents say when you were asking these questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess she, uh, I don't remember her, her exact answer, but I, I, um, 
I guess they they tried in their, in their sort of baffled way to to give me an answer. I don't remember exactly what they said, but they've always been very um, uh, open minded and, and I suppose non non traditional in the sense that when I when I was about a year old, my dad also got into a thing called mac- macrobiotics, which is yeah. uh, a really um, sort of quite um, um, committed form of like health health so so it's health foods he was really into whole foods and health foods and Mm. you know we 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 were we didn't take any sugar dairy or meat Mm. um it's a japanese sort of way of life i guess Mm. the the ancient japanese way of health and he um he got really into it and um and we lived in dublin i mean it's hard for now for people to go to sort of rewind we live now in this world where everything's on the internet we sort of know everything and and we've sort of seen and heard everything but if you go i mean if you go back to sort of 1972 in dublin i mean dublin was on the edge of the world in in a sense you know london like you know it, it was really a sort of a very small place and to have to be talking about some of these things then my dad's also like a top hairdresser he's like ireland's uh, sort of vidal sassoon and right. um, he would have all his clients and they'd be asking him he, he obviously got quite excited about telling them about all this stuff you know because he, he was excited he said, you know you'll be healthy you won't be sick you know and everything else and mm. you'll live longer and all this and um but they, 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 some people definitely thought he was a bit mad. <laughs> for Ireland, absolutely. I mean, At I lived time. in Ireland for a while. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and not, not as cosmopolitan as Dublin. I was in Limerick. But oh, yeah. even so, in Ireland, it was, yeah. you know, Guinness, meat. Meat and two veg, that's it. Yeah. And it's, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah, and he opened a whole food uh, a whole food store uh, in about 1975, and um, oh. I mean there was a community of them who who were into it, but like outside of that, you know, yeah, it was it was just way 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 ahead of its time. Well, so both your dad and you were way ahead of your time because, of course, you know, being mindful, feel, finding mindfulness and happiness and meditation and all of those things are becoming so mainstream now. now yeah very yeah. trendy yeah and but you guys were like the pioneers <laughs> in ireland for god's sake <laughs> well I, I suppose yeah and i and so i guess that's what i mean by that my dad and my mom and my family environment was very broad and open yes. and kind of uh, supportive of of things uh, regardless of how unusual they seemed if you like absolutely okay and then mm. and then i mean again being in ireland then becoming a monk, going into, <laughs> how did you even, you know, there wasn't any internet. How did you yeah. decide, right, oh, I've I've read this and I yeah. want to do it. And how did you go about it? Yeah, well, um, it's interesting, the kind of uh, connection, because when I was 15 in uh, school, one of my close friends, he said to me, um, I'm going around all the different world relig- religions and I'm just checking them out. And I'm going this Sunday to the Hare Krishna temple in Dublin. Would you like to come? And I said, yeah, I'll go along. So um, I was I was in my sort of stockbroker yuppie uh, period. And so I had a kind of a jacket and a shirt and tie and everything. <laughs> I was going along uh, and I got uh, mugged by some punks on the street wow. uh, on my way to meet him. And they, they sort of punched me around a bit and smashed a, a strawberry milkshake over my head. So I wasn't exactly in the most, um, you know, composed frame of mind, but mm. I went and met him. You and we still went, went. We went anyway, yeah. And um, and uh, I didn't really take in much. The, the, all around the world, the Hare Krishna temples, they do um, a thing called the Sunday Feast. So wherever they are in the world and pretty much in most big cities, um, you go along and you can hear some philosophy. They'll do some music and meditation and then they'll give everybody a free vegetarian feast. So I didn't really take in much of the philosophy. The music, likewise, but I loved the vegetarian food. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, at the end, we went up to the lady and said, oh, we really like that food. You know, what's the recipe? And she said, "Oh well, you can come next week, and we, we can we can show you." And we thought, "Nah, that sounds a bit." <laughs> so we didn't come back. <laughs> um, and then years later, um, I had studied things like Gnostic anthropology and all these different things. And I, I after I did my degree, I was in San Francisco uh, for a summer, and this, it was quite bizarre because I was living with the same friend there, and we fell out. Oh. Uh, towards the end of the time, and so I was staying with some friends, he was staying with some friends, and on the street, I got a flyer for this festival and it was called festival of chariots uh festival of lord jagannath and it was the Hare krishna people putting on this ancient festival that's been going on for you know um 
thousands of years in, in Jagannath Puri in, in, in the east side of India. Yes. And they do it in a lot of the big cities. And uh, I thought, I'll go along to that. Um, and it was, a gold, it was a sort of procession with these big colorful carts and it would end in Golden Gate Park and they'd have, you know, a feast and all the rest of it. Um, and so I was along and funnily enough, I met this same friend um, that, that I'd now fallen out with and wasn't staying with anymore, but was the same friend that I'd gone to the Hare Krishna temple with when I was 15 and we oh. bumped into each other. And here we are again oh at God. this Hare Krishna festival in, in San Francisco. And, um, yeah, it was wonderful. And so, but again, I thought I knew this and that. And so I was chatting to them about philosophy and stuff. And I kind of thought, well, I know, you know, I know better than you and this and that. So I kind of took it in a little bit, but when I came back to Dublin, I met a friend who was in a band and he used to go to the temple um, every Sunday. And he said, why, why don't you come along? And I said, yeah, okay, I'll go along. So when I went, there was a, a person there who was a student of the the founder or the person who brought that this sort of knowledge to the to the Western countries, who's called um, Srila Prabhupada. And he, this uh, student of his, uh, Tri was was giving the class and he was a very uh, attractive personality. He was Irish. Um, he was a bit like an Indiana Jones, I guess, very dynamic, very uh, deep and thoughtful person. Um, and he was explaining this philosophy in a way that um, I could just relate to it. I could see it in the world around me. So when he spoke about the world, according to how it's looked at through these ancient books of wisdom, I, it wasn't like I had to kind of uh, understand it. I could just look out the window and go, yeah, I can see that. Mm. I can see that. And so I was very attracted to him, to be honest, as in, and in the way that he could kind of make it very down to earth and understandable. Um, and so I used to go on and off pr pretty much every other Sunday or every, most Sundays. And then one day he said to me, you know, why don't you get you know more involved? And I wasn't really thinking that I would get more involved, but I kind of, then he just said, well, I've just been traveling and I've been doing this and that. He used to put on uh, spiritual festivals all over the country. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, oh, you could have come with me if I'd known. And a little light bulb went on in my head and I thought, <laughs> well, I don't really want to join the temple, but I, if I could just travel around with you, that would be really cool. Yes. And so that was kind of it. I became his right-hand man for about seven years. And I, we went to Africa, to India. We put festivals on all over the UK and Ireland for the public to come along um, for free. So we would be doing fundraising. I'm essentially, I became a fundraiser and a project manager, really. But yes. I, I didn't think of it like that's in the language of employment, if you like. Um, but but I was, yeah, I was, I was a monk. Whoa. <laughs> that's an incredible story. And... Yeah, you were obviously meant to go in that direction yeah. for a while and then and then decided to go in a different direction after that. That's so, right. So, um, so remind me again, how old were you then when that came to an end? Um, I was about 29. Um, I'd, I was now in Birmingham, based in Birmingham, which is where I still am now, because and there was a temple there that was... Um, you know, ha ha had challenges with the management and it was, it was possibly going to close down. And they asked Trabuvanath and a group of us, could we come and base ourselves there so we could keep this temple open? And so we said, yeah. So we came over and we, it was our base for going around and doing the festivals, but we also, there was a, co a community of people there who used to come, families and so on. And so we, I kind of, uh, and, and a few others at different times helped run that center and we had youth groups and all the rest of it. Um, and so I kind of, when I was coming to the end of the period where I felt like, you know, this has been amazing, but I kind of need to step into the, um, the, the I guess I was going to say the real world, but you know what I mean? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I was, I was based in Birmingham at this stage. So I was 29. So essentially my whole of my twenties, uh, I kind of, I, I spent a, a sort of a, a life of devotional, uh, focus. And then, I, but it was a funny period because I, I sort of I and liken it in, as coming back into the Earth's atmosphere from outer space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a uh, it was challenging in some ways because you know back then there wasn't the internet and so on, so we didn't um, read newspapers, we didn't watch TV, we didn't listen to the radio, just because it, like a lot of what's on those things is is sort of a different focus than what we were trying to develop. Sure. Um, and so I kind of came back into the the world you know i didn't even know who was the prime minister for example whoa you know it just but it's it's hard to understand that now but like back then if you uh, 
you know, if you didn't, there was so much less information. It was only if you went to look for it. Do you know what I mean? Of course. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So unless you're plugged into that sort of media uh, sort of channels, you wouldn't really know. No. Absolutely not. And we're all plugged in now, aren't we? I mean, we're plugged in 24-7. <laughs> we, we can't get away from any of it unless we literally switch everything off. I'm yeah. going to interject just very yeah, briefly. Yeah, I saw um, an article this morning mm. on medium.com, mm. and it's one of my favourite platforms these days, but um, about something that's happening in South Korea, and I, I forget the term of it now. Um, I'll have to find it. And um, it's 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 what you can do if you if you feel overworked and overwhelmed, you yeah. check yourself in to a prison. Wow! And this prison is called Prison Inside Me. Wow! Uh, which is uh, I found the article now. It's 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 a well, it's, they're calling it a penal themed stress reduction center, fifty miles north east of Seoul. Yeah. where meals are served through a slot in the door and a two-night <laughs> stay costs $146. Isn't that amazing? So people literally <laughs> want to check out for a week. They go and check themselves in. They've got no phone. They've got no radio. Mm. Although mm. somebody said uh, they've had to allow them to check their phone twice during the week just in case there are any emergencies. emergencies. Yeah. But there never were any, they said. Yeah, yeah. So... People just want to check out of the world. They just want to just lock me up, just yeah. give me my food. They've got a toilet and a shower, and they've yeah. got a, a yoga mat and a. It's just incredible that I mean I'd never heard of it, but I can yeah. understand why it's happening. You know. Yeah, I think it's it's amazing because, I mean, I mean it pushes you to the point where maybe they want to check out of the world completely. But I just think people want to switch off the noise. Mm. You know, there's just so much because, like, I heard a really interesting concept recently that. People think when like our memory is is kind of like a bucket. When you put too much in, a little bit of it spills out. But apparently the research says when you put too much in, it shuts down. So you can't remember anything. I don't know about you. I, I find now there's so much stuff I'm trying to hold in my head yes. that actually my memory is getting worse and worse and worse. You know, it's like as if there's just too much. There is too yeah. much, yeah. 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 Anyway. Okay. Um Really, really fascinating, and and I, I just wanted to focus on it because I think it's such an uh, amazing story and journey. So mm. you did the filming in was it Uganda? Did you say? Um, so I was in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, um, okay. and the film was made across those three countries, but mostly the 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 two orphanages we were running was in Uganda, yeah, in yeah. Kampala. And here's a funny thing: I was a um, a volunteer trustee for a period of time, and the charity is too far away from me in the UK now, mm. a small charity called Aim for Change, and oh. we provided orphanages in Uganda. And I, I travelled to Uganda for three weeks, and I did some filming there. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> but we never, never published the film because I didn't, at the time, I didn't really have any editing skills or I didn't yeah. have the software or anything like that. I just had it, mm. you know, I just saved it and then gave it to the charity and I said, oh, you know, you can use this. Yeah, but yeah. unfortunately, we never did anything with it, which is a real shame. Yeah. Uh, well, it was just on my camcorder, you know, just... Yeah. Um, but well, there was some... I mean, we did some amazing stuff from the projects all around Uganda, literally travelled all the way around Uganda to all amazing, the different um, projects that we had. We had pig projects, we had chicken projects, we had orphanages we had you know uh sending people to children to school education yeah education and oh it was enlightening yeah. enlightening anyway it, yeah okay so then so what gave you then the inspiration from having created those films to to start mm. your own company well like I said, I sort of uh, did a couple of different jobs, went back to university, did the MBA, came out of the MBA um, and initially did some consultancy work in the area of venture philanthropy and so on. But I kind of was thinking, you know, maybe I could start up something myself. Um, and I was trying to figure out what it might be. And I think, um, I, so I didn't see the connection immediately. I mean, it's easy in retrospect is that I can tell it like it's wrapped up in a, in a little parcel with a bow on it. And it's, a, <laughs> but you know, at different times in your life, it can be really, really confusing. You know, sure. I do, I do a talk where I go into universities and talk to students and I, I kind of, 
highlight five or six points in my life where I was really confused. I was at a crossroads and I didn't know what to do. And then obviously it kind of became clear as time went on. But like, so I guess my advice in that is, is when you're confused, like, don't worry about it too much because it's kind of normal. You know, it's, yeah. it's normal to be, to not know everything at, at all times. And to, sometimes you have to trust you know, just making progress or sort of seeing where you can make connections. So the thing that I, I kind of felt was what two things could I put together that maybe someone else isn't doing that, that would make something, you know, sort of unique. And I think, you know, Steve Jobs famously is kind of talked about that. And he said when he put art and technology together yes, and, and he, you know, he kind of created some new value. So I kind of saw the world of social impact or, you know, and I use that more broadly because it's not just charities nowadays that are trying to make a difference, but sort of those people who are trying to make a difference and and film and put them together. And and that was how Be Inspired Films was born. And the name, actually, I remember sitting in my car outside my house and talking to a friend of mine who was also starting a business at the time. And we were going through our lists of, of potential names that we had. And most of them were pretty silly. But um what th this one I got because my, that mentor, that um, that older monk that I was was traveling with and everything. Yes. He um, in 2001, almost at the same time uh, as I kind of was going back into the world of work, he passed away from stomach cancer, oh. um, which was quite a blow. Yeah. To me, it was a very, you know, naturally I'd become very um, close with him. And um, he, in one of his last talks that he gave to a, a bunch of young people, he said, you know, you've got to find something that inspires you. Yes. Do that. You know, you need to seek out, you have to be inspired mm. um, and, 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 you know, find out what that thing is and, and do it. And so I, that's how the name Be Inspired came from. So, um, so yeah, that, I, I sort of, and actually I wasn't really a filmmaker, although I'd, I'd made those two films. I mean, I was, I'd done them very much, you know, on a shoestring and kind of in a very basic way. Sure. Um, but, uh, one of the, the guys that I'd met, um, when I made the second film in Wolverhampton in, in, on, on the, on the education stuff it was called Anthony and uh, he was very talented. And I went to him and I said, look, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Um, you know, you're really, really talented. You, at this stage, she'd gone freelance. And I said, well, you know, can I, you know, initially use, show some of your work um, so that we can get, you know, people to, to, to give us work. And then, you know, obviously I'll just give all the work to you and we'll do it together. Um, and he said, yeah. And so that's how it kind of started. And, um, in the beginning it was quite, you know, uh, humble beginnings. And we did, uh, the very first job was with, um, a special school in the Midlands called Cherry Trees. Um, and, you know, when they asked me how I went in and met them and they were quite keen to do it and they said, uh, how much would it cost? And I didn't have a clue how much it was going to cost. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, uh, and I tr did some quick sums in my head and I um, gave them a price, which is obviously a, a fraction of what we, we charge now. But it was just getting the ball rolling and, sure. you know, like that. So, yeah. Wow. And And what... I mean, did you did you kind of work out of your home, your apartment, yeah. or whatever, wherever you were living? Yeah. So um, until so it's, that was in two thousand and nine, and until uh, two thousand and fifteen, um, I I worked uh, from an office from home. Yeah. So for a long, long time, yeah. um, I, I would have um, you know I had some various. Um, like what do you call them? Like uh, hot desking type places that I would go in and work at sometimes. But my main office and all the the equipment and the filing and the, all the rest of it, my main sort of cave, if you like, was my my office at home. And um, I did that for a long time. And I think uh, I kind of had to for a long time. And but now that I've you know actually got a uh, a sort of a, a, a separate office in, in the city, center of Birmingham, it really has transformed my life, actually. Mm -hmm. um, just having some separation, because I think that's one of the big challenges when you're running a business from home is what, when it, you know, are you at home? Are you at work? That the, getting the, the balance and, and being able to draw clear lines is really hard. Yeah. And I think I, that along with, you know, starting a new business, I, I, I massively, overworked you could say or but you know maybe you know maybe the business wouldn't be the same if i had enough but i suppose it's just a, a a balancing act that you you've got to i suppose be aware of at least 
and then and, you know you decide how you know but you know you've got to be aware you need to i know and the, the thing is when you start out on your own you you actually i mean i did this i went to look at before i even had a customer i started mm. looking at all these serviced offices like regis and Yes. You know, and you kind of go, oh, yeah. I They're really to- expensive. They're I know. really expensive. I know. Yeah. You've, you've got to have one of these addresses, you know, and so you're not, like, sending your post at home because there mm. wasn't really that much email in those days. Um, yeah. So people had to, you know, if they're posting something to you, you didn't want to come into your home. and all. I mean, I didn't in mm-hmm. the end, but it yeah. was very tempting because lots of companies did that. But, of course, they were more successful. Uh, yes. and more established and i think it is okay to start at home you know it's as long oh, totally. as you know you know there are going to be some challenges with that to begin with and you've done it mm. for a long time i'm still yeah. doing it <laughs> you know yeah, so yeah. um and that's what i mean it's like it's not that it's it's not that um i mean i think you know by necessity you have to do it in the beginning and i suppose even if you stay at home forever i suppose the main thing is is it, part of the journey is getting a better handle on being able to separate yourself from work. Yeah. It's not impossible. It's just harder, I think. I think I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And there yeah. is an element where you don't really get away from it. And mm. I suppose there is an element as well. It, it, you know, if you're so inspired in doing what you do. You it, just want to do it all the time. It though. just becomes a hobby, really. And Yeah, it, but it can become an obsession as well, though. I yeah. think... You know what I mean? It depends on your family situation, but I just think you can bury yourself into it because there's never, it, it never ends in a way. Yes. And so I just feel like I've got a family. I'm, I, uh, I got married in 2006 and I got two boys, six and a half and three and a half. And I, you know, and everyone will have different family situations, but I just, I just feel like, um, f- for myself as well and for the family, you've got to try and make sure you're not burning yourself out and, you know, you're, you're looking after everyone, you know? I, I think that's great advice. Absolutely. And it is very important, especially as we talked earlier, that we're always plugged in 24-7 and therefore you do need to unplug. And yeah. to have that separation, you know, yeah. in time is... Yeah. And I think there are more of these... You mentioned hot desking. Yeah, I think there are more of these places becoming available where you literally can go in because most of the work can be done on your laptop. Exactly. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. you can just go into an office uh, somewhere mm. with a hot desk, yeah. and you know, away mm. from it, and and you know, that that's definitely very useful to do as well. And it's actually becoming more and more affordable, and it's there's lots of new disruptors coming into that space, making it more and more affordable. And like in London, for example, you can join one of them, and they have 26 locations around the city, and you can go into any of them, yes. for example. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, and even uh, quite early on, I think I did just uh, rent an address, if you like. So for maybe 70 quid a month or something, you can have um, a registered address so you can put it on your website and get your mail there and stuff. Um, but even now, you know, for a couple of hundred pounds, you know, you can you can sort of take it out of your house. And I think if you want a designated desk in a designated space, it really jumps up. But yes. if, you're, if you're happy to sort of hot desk, yeah, it's, it can be more and more affordable. Yeah, and I remember the days where if you wanted an office space, the only way you could do it is to become a member of the Institute of Directors. Wow. <laughs> and then, you know, go to one of their offices. But, of course, yes. you know, becoming a member is very expensive. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you, but, yeah, that was the only way that you could get any office space for free type of thing, mm. but you still had to more or less pay for it. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because in many ways, like the internet and, you know, things like YouTube and, and social media and even the more availability of office space, it's kind of democratizing the the power in a way, yes. you know, it used to be very much the power was held by, you know, a few in- institutions or whatever. And it was, like you say, it excluded the normal sort of person who's, who's kind of starting from the bottom. But um, nowadays it's a lot easier to get started. Obviously there's a lot of other people doing it as well, Yes, but it is easier to get started. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. I think we've got a sense of your journey and where we've got to. So let's talk about mm-hmm you know, what you're doing today then. So you're in these nice offices in Birmingham because I've seen mm-hmm. them and they're gorgeous mm. and um, and inspired films. And so tell me a little bit about the kind of clients that you're working with today because mm. is, it, is it mainly 
you know, those kind of organizations that have got that uh, philanthropy or charities or fundraising element or how, how's yeah. it working today? Yeah, well, it, it's kind of evolved. Uh, it would, would have started off mostly focusing around sort of social enterprise and charities. Um, but as, as the sort of um, types of organizations that are getting involved in making a difference expand, we worked with, with a really broad range of, of customers. I now sort of say I look on our website, it says strategy and creative storytelling for purpose beyond profit, because I'm not, and I suppose it, it speaks from my own story. I'm not averse to business or to money or to profit. Um, you know, and sometimes the charity sector or the public sector can be. And I think that, um, it's really all about embracing, um, making a difference from wherever ever it comes from, yes. you know? Um, and, and often that's why, you know, if you see the, the p private sector, they often think of the charity sector and the, and the public sector as a drain on resources. It's a kind of handout, you know, give me some money. Um, and the, uh, charity sector, the public sector often think, you know, the public, the private sector are just, you know, l you know, line your pockets and, and greedy and selfish and whatever. So I kind of, um, we're not sector, um, specific, but we are very much around, we'll only tell stories for people who are genuinely, you know, trying to make a difference. So, so yeah, the clients, they range massively. We've got housing associations, hostels, uh, corporates who are doing CSR or who are trying to align their, their purpose with some of the sustainable development goals. We've got, um, you know, public sector universities, schools, um, medical organizations, um, innovation uh, organizations, government, uh, you know, huge range of, uh, you know, international development charities, um, you know, loads. Um, and um, they are, um, I, I kind of like that idea of them being diverse. Yes. I, I don't, I'm, I, I suppose my story says it, I don't like to, to be um, pigeonholed, I guess. Mm. You know, I like to be crossing boundaries and bringing things together mm. that, you know, are not ordinarily perhaps seen together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I heard, I heard a really interesting concept, which I love. It, it, was, uh, it was called On the Edge of Inside. And what it means is that basically you're part of something, um, but you naturally find yourself sitting at the edge of it. Because if you're in the middle of it, um, then you sometimes become consumed by it and you can't see anything else. You yes. can only see it. And if you're at the edge, you still uh, are totally for it and supportive of it, but you can also see what's outside of it. Mm. Um, and you can also sometimes off be like a critical friend to the thing itself because you're a little bit of distance from it. And so, yeah, I try to, I feel like that's where I naturally sit is sort of with something I care about, but a bit towards the edge. So I, I feel like I've got perspective. That's and I suppose that's, you know, with your background and where you've come from, it's mm. quite, it's a quality that you've developed or a value that you've developed. And I think it is also valuable to your clients to have that because yes. as a filmmaker, you, you are effectively, excuse the pun, looking through a different lens at things yeah, and therefore helping them create a better story for whatever it is that they're looking to achieve. Yeah. And I think, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, I think you're right. And I think it's, uh, often w what they need to do. And I don't, I use it. I say they, but it's the same for me. It's the same for all of us. We have to get out of our own way, mm. you know, because we're often so close to something that we think we can't see the wood for the trees. Like we think it's all important. So when you're working with an organization and they, they say, we want to do a video and you know, we want to put all of this stuff into it. And you're like, well, that's just an overload of information. That's not going to interest people. No. Um, um, but they're like, no, no, but this is important. And it's so important. And you, and, and, and just having the distance, I mean, I think, uh, it is a skill that I've developed, but, um, part of the skill is just being, you know, like you say, looking at it from a different perspective. Mm. Uh, even if I was telling our story, I would probably be able to tell a better story by having someone outside of our organization help me tell it yes. just because they're outside of it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the point you make about, you know, we, we do all, and, and actually I, do I do it? I don't know. Probably I do. I'm quite a, cause I'm a, 
I, I have this excuse and say, I'm a Dutchman, so I'm fairly straight talking. Yeah. But I, I, I do notice people advertising their own, their own, uh, what's it, their own ego an awful lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, and I'm not judging, of course I'm judging, but yes. I'm being critical because actually they're doing mm. themselves um, a disfavor, really, because it's mm. so obvious what it is that you're doing. And yeah. recently I've been noticing a huge amount of it. I've been getting a reasonable amount of connection requests on LinkedIn and I read people's profiles. And mm. I went, why would you even write that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And personal branding is becoming so important. And yeah. as you predicted on your website, you know, by 2019, 80% of all content is video. Yeah. I mean, LinkedIn now, there is so much video content that people are posting. Well, now they can, you can put video natively on LinkedIn that's now, right. so it works better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And of course, you know, more and more people are starting to do it, but yeah. but some of the content they're putting on is just, oh, really, why would you put that on? Or why would you even say that? Or yeah. So I'm, I'm noticing, I'm, I'm observing a very interesting dynamic taking place. And I think it comes back to what we said earlier, there's an overwhelm. There is mm. a, there is so much stuff out there. People are in this fear of missing out. Therefore, I've got to do something. Yeah. And I guess it's a nice segue into something else that you are doing as well, which is helping mm. people to become better storytellers on film. So tell us a little mm. bit about what you're doing there. Yeah. So um, the Be Inspired Films main sort of work is sort of high end film animation and live streaming of events and stuff. But we also help people, whether they're in an organization or whether they're, you know, uh, an entrepreneur or have their own small business to take advantage of video and storytelling like on a real budget. So, you know, if they want to try and do some of it themselves so that they can, you know, put out regular videos and kind of communicate what their value is to the market, whether it's them as a, as a coach or a, a trainer or whether it's a, a business. So we call it video know-how mm. um, Academy. And we mean, we actually started it very early on as well, about 2009 and trained thousands of people now. And it's, it really, I, I really get what you're saying there about people putting out videos. So I think there's a couple of misconceptions. Um, I think one is that, um, well, firstly, I suppose a lot of people are going on these personal branding courses and so, or sort of internet marketing or digital marketing type courses. And so uh, what you find is a lot of the stuff that comes out from people feels the same. Yes. You know what I mean? It all feels the same. And so after a while, your brain just switches off. Oh, there's another one of this, you know, and especially where it feels sort of salesy in any way or markety in any way that it just that approach just really doesn't work anymore. Uh, I don't think I think people have just seen it and, you know, they, they switch off. And I think also this idea and I think we're all guilty of it when if we are on camera or if we are making videos to think that they have to be super professional and to think that we have to come across like some kind of a TV presenter. Yes, we all you know, it's a bit like back to that thing of, you know, it's almost like only certain people can be on TV correct? Uh, or, or, you know, and it's not for the normal person. And and if you want to be like that, you better be like them. Um, and it's still a deeply kind of ingrained thing. And so uh, one of the things we try and encourage people when we're training them to, to do their own videos is to, to kind of switch off that need and to, to sort of accept and embrace themselves as they are and you know you're not there's also a lot of pressure on us because we see people getting millions of views for this and that and the other and we think that that's what we have to do mm. really we don't if we have a really good service or a product for a certain group of people even if we're just talking to a couple of hundred people but it's a really valuable and useful thing to them that's a huge success mm huge success mm -hmm. you know because so i think that's another thing you know it's we 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 have to try and uh, if we're going to go on and, and put ourselves out there not do it for numbers or for um i guess fame in that sense but because we actually believe there's a real problem in the world that a, a, enough people or a certain group of people are experiencing and we believe that we have a product or service that could genuinely help them with that yeah. um and coming from that kind of a uh uh, a motivation um 
then we obviously just need to make sure we reach those people and and if and, and get feedback. And if they say, well, actually, I do have that problem, but it's not quite that. If if you could do this, that that would be amazing. And you know, so sort of start to talk to people and um, engage with them. And and um, I think it's. Uh, yeah, so the the training is all about not just the technical skills to do, put the videos together, but to how to be confident and authentic and natural on camera, and how to learn storytelling approach. So, like, what what you'll find if you go to a networking event or if you're, you know, people a lot of times on their videos, they t- start talking about themselves first. Yes. Whereas actually in reality, I mean, it's a harsh thing to say, but people don't give a damn about you or what you do. Mm. They really don't care. Mm. But if you can connect with them and uh, show that you understand the challenges that they're facing um, and that you understand them. So it's all about them first. Then they might be going, okay, now you've got my ears. And then you can say, and actually because of that, this is what I'm doing and this is who I am. Then they, they may well listen. But if it's just me, 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 me straight away, you know, people just, yeah, they're probably not listening. They they rarely listen, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and that's because of two reasons. One, it's what they're hearing is not that interesting because it's very salesy and it's an advert, and it's not about them, <laughs> and it's not about them, and they're also listening, or the rather not listening because they're trying to rehearse what they're going to say, yes, uh, and comparing. They're saying, "Oh, he or she said that. Maybe that's what I need to say now," and they're making up like on the hoof, their signature speech or their introduction is becoming yeah. a muddle, you know, so people tend to kind of stand mm. up and go blah. Um, and I think the same is happening on video. Yeah. So people are going to say, oh, I don't know how to do it. Yeah, there's the mechanics mm. of it. But then when I'm on it, I don't know what to say. Yes. And I think that's, some, yeah, it's a massive thing. And it's, it's back to, you know, presentation skills. There has to be an element of practice. Yeah. Because we still see if we go to presentations, there are a lot of bad presenters out there because they don't know how, what to do. You know, they haven't been trained. Yeah, and, yeah. And all that people know is, oh, I'll just do a PowerPoint and just read the PowerPoint. And that's how you present because... They rely on that, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. everybody does the same thing. Yeah. So I think... It's fantastic that you're teaching people how to do that because it's really, really necessary. And it's like presentation skills for video. That's what it is. Specifically for video, yeah. 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 And it's, it's so it's storytelling, it's uh, t- practical skills for doing the video, filming and editing. But also we cover an element of strategy, which is why are you making the video? <laughs> That's mm. probably the most important thing of all, which is like, why are you making it? How is it going to deliver value and for who? And how is it going to help you in, 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 you know, with your business? Mm. Um, and yeah, it's funny that you say that about the, um, the, one of the ways is as well is, is to, is to just start, you know, I think it's one of those things. What do people say? If you're waiting for it to be perfect, it will never be perfect. So at least if you're starting and even if it's not very good, you can get feedback and you can improve, but you'll never get good if you don't start. You know what I mean? I, I, I think that's a brilliant kind of, we should tweet that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a brilliant quote. And I, I think that's so totally true. And the same goes for starting your own business, by the way. Exactly. Because I spent months and months and months trying to get it perfect before I launched. Yeah. And I missed months and months and months of actually getting out there and doing something. And yeah. that's why it's so fabulous to hear you say, when you were doing your first film, uh, yeah. going to quote for it, and they asked you how much is it, and you didn't really know. I didn't really know. <laughs> um, and it's okay, you know, when you get into that space, but you made it happen. Look where you are now. So, yeah. Um, and I suppose it, not to, um, not to um, be boasting but i suppose when you say look where we are now just to give people an idea of kind of how far we have come along we we uh, had a film that was nominated for the royal television society awards which was great a couple of years ago Mm -hmm. um but also we um are part of a thing called the recommended agency register which is a lot of the creative agencies in the uk will um you become a member um and you know big clients can go on there and see the different agencies and so on. But once a year they have a thing where they, uh, have the recommended agency register awards. And, um, we've 
been in it the last four years. Um, and you get all your clients to rate you. And, and they rate you across a whole bunch of stuff like on time, on budget, creativity, yes. all that. But they also rate you for the services that you've provided for them. Um, and they do it anonymously. So mm. um, there's lots of different types of awards. I, I, I feel kind of the integrity of these is quite strong because they can they can pretty much say whatever they like. Really. Sure. Um, and yeah, so we, this year we're we're go, it'll be in April the twenty fourth. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll be the third year that we'll have won the um, video TV production company of the year in the UK um, uh, under forty staff. So, it, which is a, which is a great testament, I guess, because our clients you know, we had ni- seventy clients rate us last year. And we got a ninety six percent average. Um, so that is really encouraging. I'm not sure if we will continue it after this year because I'm going through a personal thing where I'm thinking I want to, I don't want it to be about all that awards and marketing stuff and everything else. But I think Mm. they're also, they can be very powerful tools, you know, to sort of talk to clients about. And I think there's, there's value in them. And I think it's just interesting looking at our, our own relationship with, um, how much we shout about ourselves and how much we put ourselves out there. Uh, and I'm kind of feeling like I'm, I'm maybe going to back off from that a bit. But nonetheless, uh, I'm really proud of it, you know. I think at the end of the day, we all want to be recognised for something that mm. not only pushes our mission further and mm. certainly listening and hearing your story, you certainly have a mission for something and, mm. you know, creating storytelling for purpose beyond profit is a great mission to have. Mm. And therefore, being recognized in the industry for doing a great job, that Mm. will further your mission at the end of the day. Because there is, I've been quite challenging to award ceremonies over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, I won't go into details, just my own personal thing. But Mm -hmm. I I have this love-hate relationship with it on the basis of, um, actually, yeah, everybody wants to be, rewarded for what they've done yes. and at the same time is it our ego wanting that reward or what is it for now in your case and i'm not trying to be biased because you're a guest on my podcast um in your case you you have a particular purpose mm-hmm. uh, in in terms of making these films for that kind of sector or that not sector but that that storytelling medium for purpose beyond profit and mm. therefore getting some recognition to help you further that I think would be really, really useful. And I'm yeah. totally with you on the fact that you're reconsidering it for next year as well. <laughs> Let's yeah. put it that way. And I'll, answer, I'll, I'll answer you honestly. Part of that is because um, it's mixed. You know, I, mm. I am delighted that we're getting the recognition for the work we're doing and I'm passionate about it and I really, you know, love supporting people who are making a difference and everything else. But, uh, you know, part of it is my ego, mm. for sure, 100%. Mm. And so, um, and I recognize that. And and I think to myself, you know, it's great that um, we've we've had that success and everything else, but I maybe I can, maybe I don't have that need as much now. Mm. And so I feel like maybe it's healthier for me to kind of um, back off a bit. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. I look forward to that. Yeah. The, the next step you're going to take in that. Ravenel, are, are there any things about your business and what you're doing that I haven't teased out of you? Is there something else? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I wrote down a couple of things that we might chat about, like sort of some of the challenges and some of the highlights and stuff. And yeah. I don't know if you wanted to go to yes, that. If you have time, yes, please. Yeah, always good to hear those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, in the last uh, – so my the, my business model was me doing the job of about six people <laughs> – Yes. Uh, you know, because I didn't have a team, uh, like a core you know, office type, you know, team. So I'm yes. doing the social media, the accounting, the marketing, the sales, that you know, all everything, um, and and a lot of the delivery as well in terms of the producer director stuff. Um, and I had a team of, uh, I have a team of, you know, great freelancers that we use regularly who are, you know, animators, designers, camera people, editors, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um. But then as we started to grow and as I wanted to try and grow the business as something more than just me, mm. um, I was looking at growing our, the, the team, you know, so bringing in people to support me with, you know, admin and, and sort of accounting and, and marketing and social media and, and so on. Um, 
And I've probably been trying to do that uh, for the last three years now. Um, and I've had, uh, you know, some some of the people have worked out really well, others not so well. Mm. And part of that was maybe me um, not having proper clarity on the roles that I was putting people into um, or not having proper clarity or sometimes choosing people for a role like say I had one person do business development because I didn't really want to do it yes. <laughs> rather than, you know, and so I've had sort of various false starts in in, in various ways like that. Um, and as of February this year, um, it's back to, uh, in terms of on the payroll, just me. Yes. Um, and my wife is helping me uh, with a few things. But what it's forced me to do is to really step back and go, OK, well, you've been you've been trying this now for a bit. And what have you learned from it? And, you know, to sit down and get real clarity on what are all the roles that or activities or, you know, things that need to be done within the business and start to really figure them all out and get really clear on them and then group them together and so on and kind of figure out, OK, which bits can we do? Mm like within ourselves, within the business, which bits do I need help with, which, and how would those form into roles? And okay, now I've got a couple of roles in an ideal world. If I, if I had some, you know, backer or something, I would say, put in the perfect team and we'll, we'll work through it and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll build the sales to pay for it over the next couple of years. I don't have that. Mm. So what I'm, what I'm uh, doing is I'm going, okay, well, out of those roles, which one, I can afford one on the payroll, which one will I employ first mm. and so hopefully i'm going to go back into that um process um with a much better chance of success for that person working for the business yes and working for them as well well you know we could have a whole other podcast on this one but i i will th th this is a great point because i i work with a freelance illustrator who does all my illustrations for some of mm. the animations that I do mm. and because I don't want to employ people, right? Yes. I'm, I'm probably too old <laughs> to do that, <laughs> but that's an excuse that I use. The reason yeah. I didn't want to is very, very varied. I didn't want the responsibility anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But apart from that, I think one of the things, I'm not suggesting this is you, but most small businesses don't think – necessarily necessarily yeah. Yeah. um as some of the bigger businesses do and I, they don't always get it right but there's yeah. one advice i will give you you probably have already done this but mm -hmm. and that is values yes people rarely in big organizations even yeah recruiters in general do not talk about values and values mm. is the one thing that is massive particularly in owner managed businesses where if people that come in there and all they want is a paycheck at the end of the yes. day, yes. if they don't yeah. buy into the values and the mission of the company and completely want to live those values day in, day out and actually feel part of it, they yeah. are always going to think I'm just there for a paycheck. Yes. Now, I'm not yes. suggesting all employees are like that. Totally not. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, lots yeah. and lots of people are so motivated about their business that they work for big and small yeah, yeah. Um, but having a set of values and teasing those out with people that you sit with and interview and chat mm. with is so so important and I, I, any small business I've spoken to they 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 kind of go oh yeah I never thought about mm. that and often the funny thing is is that they do have their values but they've not really gone through the process of kind of crystallizing them you know and having them front and center you know absolutely and when we when we work in corporates you know we've been involved in the process and everything and then we start on our own and we went oh yeah we don't need that but actually yeah. excuse my french but actually that's all right further down the road you kind of go oh god i've got these people with me but i never really understood their values and they don't understand yes. my or the business's values, you know. So yeah. we really need to do a better job to get people bought in right at the beginning because then mm. we can get unstuck. And, you know, values are so ingrained into people um, yeah. that, that you can't shift them very often. You cannot shift people's values because yeah. you, you, you got your values when you were eight. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've, I speak to people and they say, you get everything you ever need in life by the age of seven. You've, you've already got your personality, you've decided yeah. what you're going to do, and you don't realize it yet. But 
So it was yeah. interesting to hear you say at the age of eight, you were asking all these questions because you'd just turned seven or eight and, you know, so, yeah, yeah you yeah. probably formed your values then and you were already, you were unusual expressing them at that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, that's a, a work in progress still, the team thing, but I feel, um, and I suppose that's a really good example of, you know, you could look at that a variety of ways. You could look at it, one could look at it like, you know, I so far I've failed to make that work. But I, but another way to look at it is, is that I've experimented as best with the best knowledge that I had at various points along the way, and I've learned some stuff, and I'm ready to try again. Exactly. You know, and and just hopefully do it a little bit better. You know. Yeah. Um, another one. Um, so I've got three. Um, okay. Is just about prioritizing. Um my time and energy, I guess. Um, I'm a bit of a, um, I put my all into everything, mm. but it's just about having that discretion of like when to accelerate, when to break, when to, what to, what to give your energy to first. Um, you know, what, what, you know, prioritizing what's, mo what's the most, what are you going to get the most value out of for the business? Uh, and it's often isn't those things like doing your emails and, you know, doing the filing and whatever. <laughs> I mean, they have to be done, but, what are the big things uh, that you should tackle first? Because often we're, we're, we don't realize it, but we're putting off the things that are probably the most valuable, but that we don't quite want to do maybe because they're big or, or whatever. 100%. So that's, a, that's the second one. And the third one, which is something that I'm kind of really only learning more recently, is, is kind of learning to get out of my own way. Mm. And I don't know if that makes sense straight away, but what, what, I, what I mean by that is like figuring out what am I good at and where do I get in the way? Like where are the bottlenecks? Am I holding on to stuff and not willing to give it away or to give ownership to someone else to, am I uh, holding on too tightly? Am I getting them to do stuff, but then it having to come through me and then I don't get around to seeing it. So I'm the bottleneck, mm. you know, where like just learning to kind of know where you're useful and where you're not quite as useful. Um, and that's something that I'm sort of becoming more aware of. And I think it's, I've heard it said before, it's, 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 it's what people sometimes say, well, when I learned how to get out of my own way, that's when I really was able to make progress, you know. That, that's our mission, isn't it, on this planet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to, get yeah. Out of our, to get out of our own way. I, I think all three you've mentioned there are just 100% spot on. The mm. last one is I think the toughest one for us all to it's grapple hard, with. Yeah. 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 Especially yeah. running our own businesses, you know, because yeah. if it's only us or if it's only us plus five or whatever, yeah. you know, the dynamics around us is 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 just vital. And for us to, you know, to really get to know ourselves and what drives us and what what we think is important or not important yeah spot on I, I love those yeah thank you thank you okay great Ravenel thank you for those they they were absolutely brilliant and um so I've got one more question and that is if there was one piece of advice that you would give to a somebody who's dying to start their own business um, what would it be? Well, it's kind of off the back of that thing I was saying about getting out of your own way. It's to make sure you work on yourself as well as working on the business. Because um, as you develop the business, you know, hopefully you'll have sales and you'll have some progress. But if you can work on yourself alongside that, um, not only will you be probably happier and more balanced and so on, but you will be better in your business too. And that's something I, it's taken me 10 years in business to figure out. So that would be my, uh, my big piece of advice. And, and w is there anything specific that people can do <laughs> with yeah, that? Good point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just scrub yourself in the shower. No, <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, good, very good point. So, um, well, things like, um, um, exercise, mm -hmm. looking after your health, looking after your diet, um, looking after your, your sort of, whether you call it, whatever you, w one might call it, you know, I might call it your, your soul or your sort of your inner life, if you like. So that might be by doing some meditation, mindfulness, these things are, there's apps for it now, you know, that you can just spending a little time every day to, 
kind of focus your intention for the day. Um, practicing gratitude is a big thing that uh, is very powerful. You know, focusing on what's good in your life rather than the stuff that you don't have or the the bit that's lacking. Yes. And and going out into the day with that kind of a lens. Um, you know, uh, also you know doing some personal development stuff. You know, where you are giving yourself the safe space to explore some of your stuff that maybe, you know, sometimes people trigger us in certain ways and we react in a certain way and maybe understanding that stuff a bit better so that, you know, you can have the same trigger, but, you know, it you don't have to always react in the same way when you understand it better, mm. like whether it's flying off the handle or getting angry or whatever it might be. Um, uh, or even just down to having, um, uh, you know, if you have a paper diary or a journal, having one. I just bought one recently called uh, the Stoic Journal. And mm -hmm. every day it just gives me a really interesting question to ask myself. And it kind of, you know, comes at you from a sort of a bit left field. And it makes you go, wow. Like and one of them might be, for example, um, how could you uh, look at people today as if, they only have good intentions, yes. for example, yes. rather than thinking that people have bad intentions. Just little things to kind of reset your your um, your brain, you know, to see things in a more positive way. So I, I guess there's a whole bunch of things there. But even if you, you know, just do any of those to make sure that you're not just a machine, you know, you're not just a machine working on your business, just grinding away. You know, you need to look after yourself as well. Very, very sensible advice. And I never knew this any of this until I left the corporate world and started my own business. Mm. And luckily for me, I, I did a personal development course before I started my own business and it gave me resilience, I think. And I think mm. what you what you've described, all the different tools that are out there, and then there are many, mm. um, will build you, will give you that resilience to anything that might come your way when your business might not go the way you want it to go. Yeah. And we will all go through those times. Yeah. And you do yeah. need to resilience to say, actually, everything's going to be okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to be okay. The business is going to be okay. Or yeah. I need to reinvent and do something different. Um, yeah. They're so, tools. They're, they're, yeah. It, gives you, it gives you new tools to, to kind of navigate, um, you know, whereas previously – obviously whatever tools we have we do our best but you know it, it in my experience is it helps you to be able to do that more effectively love it yeah thank you and and so what else are you working on Ravenel? Are, are there any exciting projects you you can share with us yeah actually um one thing that i am really excited about personally is it's 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 sort of part of the business but it's not for uh, a client as such is i'm making a feature length documentary um mm. which uh, in, in 2016 in november i went out with a group of people um and we were doing a, a sort of a, a sponsored challenge to raise money for a charity out in india that was uh, that that re that uh, helps to educate girls because in India oftentimes the girls don't yes. get education as much as the boys. Yes. Um. And and this Craig's adventure was uh, to go eighteen hundred kilometers on a tuk tuk, <gasps> so, you know, like these three wheel rickshaws. Um. And you know, I'm, you may you may know you may not know you may have heard stories of the Indian roads, but I'm telling you, my mm. God, they are there. Are, there are cows in the road, dogs, tractors, huge trucks. There's no traffic lights. It's there's huge potholes Pollution. like bathtubs. Yeah. Just rubbish. You know, it's, I mean, I love India, uh, uh, but it's a very, it's the wild west, you know, yes. <laughs> the wild east. <laughs> um, and, um, so we were driving from Mumbai, which is on the West coast, all the way down the West coast to the very tip of India, where the three oceans meet at the very bottom. Mm. Um, and, uh, but I decided, you know, having signed up to do it and for the charity and everything else, well, why don't I take a film crew and, um, and make a documentary along the way, wow. which obviously is about the road trip, but the deeper purpose of it is about talking to people and exploring, you know, um, what is this, this sort of challenge around girls education in, in India today? Yes. Um, and also it was a bit of a homecoming for me because, uh, 20 years ago, I lived in a, in a rural village in India. And at the end of this trip, I, I was going to go back there for the first time after 20 years. Mm. So it was kind of like I had multiple layers. And 
it's a it's a sort of a personal project so i've financed it myself to date i'm now at the point where i have a trailer and i'm going out and speaking to people and looking for um you know some some supporters to try and help me to finish the film but i'm very very excited about it because as much as the work we do uh, with clients is wonderful when you're paid by somebody to do a film obviously you know your your job and your your sort of duty is to is to create their story sure. when you follow a story yourself and and you're kind of doing it more from a creative lens and there's no client as such um it's just really exciting from a creative perspective mm. and from a storytelling perspective to be able to follow the story as you see it you yes. know fully yes. um and what's the ultimate goal with this yeah Where- so Definitely, yeah. So the ultimate goal is to um, is to raise awareness about around the issue of girls' education. Yes. To um, to kind of give people an insight into uh, that issue through a, in an, in an entertaining format, you know, through on this this sort of a bit of a crazy road trip, and I suppose through the lens of this ex monk who who's who's sort of the viewer is experiencing the journey through his eyes. Mm. Um, and what we'd like to do is get it to a small cinema release, you know, here and in India, um, and then perhaps have it on Netflix or something like that. But the main thing, and, you know, also to offer it out to charities working in that area to be able to use it as a tool to, um, you know, to, to help them with the work they're doing. Um, so if people are wanted to check that out again on the, it's actually a hidden page on the um, Be Inspired Films website. But if you just do beinspiredfilms.co.uk forward slash tuk tuk movie, but you can put it in the show notes. Yeah, it would be great to hear what people think about it. And if there's any way that they might want to get involved, that'd be amazing. I will definitely put it in the show notes. And it sounds a wonderful project. Well done, you. And yeah, I, I think, yeah, let's let's aim to get it onto Netflix. That would be just brilliant. <laughs> That would be brilliant. Yeah, that that's what we want. That's what that's what the ultimate goal is, I think. Yeah, uh, because then the message will go globally. Oh, I, and yeah. there are some great documentaries actually on Netflix. I watched a couple over the weekend, and um, I'm I'm really enjoying Netflix not just for the storytelling, but for some of the documentaries that are. Oh, on they're there. amazing! Yeah, there's some amazing ones. It really, really, really is, and it gives us yeah, it gives us, it opens it broadens our perspective, doesn't it? Mm, definitely, and that's the. That's the kind of personal development food for the mind type of thing as well, yeah. uh, which I think is is good. We 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 could talk for many hours, Ravenel. We could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, where where can people find you? Where can they look at all your films and and things that you've created and get connect with you? Um, so if you go to beinspiredfilms.co.uk, you'll be able to see, uh, what we do, the kind of services we offer, the types of people we work with. And there's a, if you just do a forward slash portfolio, but there's a, there's a tab at the top of the website, you can see a whole bunch of our films. Yeah. Um, if people are interested in the video training, they can go to videoknowhow.co.uk. Yeah. Um, and on all the social platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, we're at Be Inspired Films or at Video Know How. Um, and yeah, I'd be more than happy for people. It would actually be really nice to hear. And if people have questions or they want to connect, um, or I'm, I'm on LinkedIn as well as Ravenel Chambers, uh, I'd be really happy to, um, to hear some feedback. It would be nice, but also to help people if they've got anything I can help with. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Fascinating stuff. Really, really fascinating stuff. And yeah. um, I know we'll meet up for a coffee one day again in Birmingham. I'm not that far away from you. So, Definitely. Yeah. So we can we can chew the fat about this industry or other things or life in general. That would be really cool. And that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks, Ravenol. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Bye for now. Bye bye. Staying alive UK. Share your story. 